The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It's my portion, says my soul. Therefore I will hope in him. Let's sing that again. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. Therefore, I will hope in him. Amen. Good morning. We are glad you are here today. We want to continue to uh, pray for our missionaries and pray that uh, Steve and Nalu and and others that we're supporting, both in Croatia and Romania, are, are doing well. Pray for our ministry back here with Foster and Hope. Uh, next Sunday morning at 9.30, uh, their executive, new executive director will share with us at 9.30, from 9.30 to 10.30, Fostering Hope's vision for 2023, where they've grown from in the last year, year and a half or so, and where they're headed in hopefully the next five to 10 years. So, Please make uh, an opportunity to be here next Sunday morning at 9.30 to welcome Lynn and one of his associates. I'm not sure uh, which one, but he, he texted me and said one of the, the young ladies that works there is going to join us. Uh, in times past, we've had Julie come and present. She does a fantastic job. Lynn is just absolutely on fire to, uh, to grow Foster and Hope into a, have a larger footprint within the state and perhaps even the nation most definitely in God's kingdom. Uh, Steve got a good report on his health or a better report. His health is a little bit improved. Nalu's still struggling. So let's pray for those gentlemen. Let's stop and pray before we go any further. God, our Father, as we reach out into the world to talk to those who are hurting, those who are lost, those who are blind to their sin, those who are blind to who you are and how powerful you are, we pray that you give us patience. We pray that you will give us the words to say. We pray that you will instill within us a deep love for those who are lost, for those who are hurting, for those who are on a path to eternal destruction. Because, Father, we too were on that path at one point. And it's only by your grace, only by your mercy, only by your love, and the people who have influenced us that we stand before you, that we kneel before you this morning. We pray for our missions. We pray for Steve. We pray for Naylor. We pray for all those in Romania. We pray for Fostering Hope. We pray for the Central Texas Children's Home and any others, Father, that uh, and, and as Keith is in Fort Myers this morning, we pray for the mission that he and, and Chris Mueller are working on trying to recover some of those things that the hurricane destroyed so many months ago. We're grateful for this opportunity to be together. Pray the power of the Holy Spirit rests on your word, opens our hearts and our eyes to who you are. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. I'm going to start off by asking you a question this morning. Do you ever feel inadequate? Inadequate is in its adjective form. Insufficient quantity to meet a need. It's also lacking the requisite qualities or resources to meet the task. Do you ever feel like you don't have enough or you are not enough to meet the task or to perform the task or to meet the goal? Do you ever feel inadequate? Now, that's kind of a loaded question is the uh, laughter I got from, from Sean, I believe it was. <laughs> You're like, uh, duh, rhetorical question, stupid question, dummy. Of course. It says fear right here. 
particular that causes us to do things to mask our feelings of inadequacy. There's an article out uh, a few years ago that says three out of four men say that they would rather spend the rest of their life unloved and alone rather than feeling disrespected and inadequate. Think about that. Three out of four men would rather be by themselves and away from everything and everybody rather than to spend their life unloved disrespected and inadequate. The truth of the matter is that we all have feelings of inadequacy at times. We all do. So it causes, in some of us, it causes us to boast beyond what we are actually capable of. We overcompensate. Some of us, we can become workaholics. Some of us have unreal expecta unrealistic expectations of ourselves. And then we take those expectations and we put them onto other people. And trust me, I have four people in my household who know that. All too closely. These feelings of not being good enough or successful enough cause anxiety in us. And then we can project that into every single relationship that we have. Now imagine if you're a teenage girl and God tells you that you are going to be the mother of his son. That you are going to raise the promised Messiah. Talk about feeling inadequate for the task. But what we're going to learn from Mary today is despite her insecurity, in spite of her feelings of inadequacy, she shows us how God can use us to do big things for him. And that's our question for today, isn't it? Can God use me as we continue our Quest 52? Can God use me for big things is our, is our topic. We're in week three of our uh, series in our pursuit of Jesus. As we continue this Quest 52, we're going to look at the person of Jesus. We're going to look at the power of Jesus. We're going to look at the preaching of Jesus. And we're going to look at the passion of Jesus that sent him to the cross. And for those of us who have had teaching and preaching class, I did four Ps right there. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome to be able to line those up. I didn't do that. It's not original with me. So uh, I borrowed that heavily from... A uh, gentleman uh, from a church in Las Vegas. Believe that or not, a church in Las Vegas. And no, it's not the church of Elvis and slot machines, no. It's already been mentioned this morning by Mike, and it's my prayer that this be the greatest year of spiritual growth for you, for me. That we lean into all that God wants to do in us. Our focus today is Mary, the mother of, Joseph, of Jesus. Rather, If you want to open your Bibles up to Luke chapter 1, we're going to find the story in there. Now, even though Mary gets a lot of attention, we really don't know a lot about her. We don't know anything about her before Jesus. We don't really know how she was raised. We don't know when she died or where she died. She appears here in the birth of the Messiah. And she makes a few cameo appearances through the Gospels. And after that, she barely gets a speaking part. She's mentioned one time in the book of Acts. And brothers and sisters, that's it. And despite that, God uses her to do big things for him. Luke chapter 1, beginning in verse 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth a town in Galilee. Now, we don't know how Elizabeth was related to Mary for certain. Some say she might have been a cousin. Others say she was an aunt. Regardless of that, Elizabeth is old enough to be her grandmother. And Luke tells us that Elizabeth and her husband, Zechariah, were very old and were never able to have children. If you were with us back in December, you may recall or remember our study on miraculous birth in the Bible, the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah is probably familiar to you because their son is going to be known as, anybody? John the baptizer, that's right. Zechariah serves in the temple 
on this particular day that he that Gabriel comes to visit him, he's the one who goes in to light the incense inside the temple, which is a prayer. It is the time of prayer. Lighting the incense is the time of prayer. Gabriel says, God's heard your prayer. Well, what prayer would that be? That child. How can that happen? Because we're old. After that, Gabriel goes and meets, six months later or so, he goes to Nazareth and introduces himself to Mary. Nazareth is a small, insignificant town. It was a city that was built on a little bit more than 10 acres and had a population of about 300 people, 15 miles from just about anything. Half of the people that were born in Nazareth would die. The mortality rate in Nazareth for that period of time was 50%. The other half had a life expectancy of about 30 to 40 years. And so here's Mary, a 15-year-old girl living in a small town, an insignificant town. An angel of God appears to her Tells her some things. She's a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, these words highly favored in the Greek means that she is already favored. She has found favor not because of who she is, not because of where she is from, not because of something she is going to do, not because of something that she has done in the past. God finds favor with her. And I think it would have been surprising to her because if there were two words to describe Mary from a worldly perspective, it wouldn't be highly favored. She's from an insignificant town. And frankly, she's engaged to an insignificant man. A carpenter named Joseph. He's a day laborer. He has no power. He has no influence. He's insignificant. But God highly favors those that the world completely ignores. As we read further in verse 29, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, fear not, Mary, you have found favor with God. And I think Mary's reaction here is the reaction that most of us would have. Her, her reaction wasn't, well, hey, this is fantastic news. I can't wait to tell my fiance, Joseph, that I'm pregnant, whom I've never had relationships with. He's going to be so pumped and psyched. I don't know if they used the word pumped and psyched back in Old Testament times. But she doesn't say this either. You know, I've always knew, I've always known I would be destined for greatness. That I knew I was going to, that, that something great and powerful and wonderful was going to come on me. No, she reacts. How can this be? She was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting that might be. What does it mean that this angel is coming to speak to me? And first of all, if I know anything about history, when angels come to talk to people, the results are usually not good. Somebody's done something wrong. Have I done something wrong that the angel is coming to appear to me? What, what does this mean? What can it all mean? What's going on? She's curious. She wants to know. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of reading this might be. But the angel said to her, fear not, Mary, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son. You would call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. 
The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How can this be? She knows that she's troubled by the opportunity that, that she'll be pregnant, but she hasn't had physical relations. In that world that she lived in, under the Jewish customs, the Jewish laws, she, being pregnant out of wedlock, could be taken out of town and stoned to death. Now, by the time that she comes along, that practice had mostly been done away with. But if you look at the life of Jesus, they tried to take him out of town a couple of times and stone him. So they weren't all abandoning that, that aspect of it. So there's a real fear that she could be that. Or that there's a real fear that, that Joseph will divorce her and that she and her life could never marry again or would never marry again. If you hang out with people, it doesn't matter whether it's your family or your neighbors at work. Everybody I know loves the teachings of Jesus. Gabriel says some outstanding things about Jesus here in verses 31 through 33. Everybody loves the teachings of Jesus, but there are a lot of people who would say that, well, you know, he was just a prophet. Maybe he was a miracle worker. He was a good teacher. But that's not the claim here. The claim that Gabriel is making, the claim that God is making, is that this is Messiah. Now, to what young Jewish woman who wouldn't want to hear that? This Messiah that's long been promised, this Son of God that's supposed to come and deliver us. Every young girl in, Jew, in, in Judaism, in, in Israel, wanted to hear those words. My son will be Messiah. My son will be the anointed. My son will be king. But something is nagging at Mary. And she says, well, how will this be since I'm a virgin? Now, notice the different reaction of Gabriel and God towards Mary than what, he, what Gabriel's reaction to Zechariah was. Zechariah was, man, I'm old. How's that going to happen? He didn't believe that God could do it. Mary's looking at it from the mechanical side. Well, I'm 15 years old and I'm from hip town nowhere. Insignificant town, insignificant husband. You know, we're a little backwater back here. We're so we live so far back in the woods, you have to pump in the daylight. But she knows one thing. She knows how babies are made. How is God going to do this mechanically? She's not doubting that God can do it. She just wants to know the process. How's it going to happen? And the angel answers, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. You, the whole, uh, excuse me, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age, and she has said to, to be unable to conceive, is that she, excuse me, and she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. See what Gabriel did right there? No word from God will ever fail. You want to know about the mechanical part of it? Here it is. The mechanical part is the Holy Spirit of God is going to come on you and you're going to conceive. Now, in our minds, I, my mind, it turns sexual very quickly. Because I'm like Mary. I know there's one way to make a baby. She's not talking about reproduction here. The angel is telling her that God will create in you the Messiah there will be no reproduction in the normal sense that everybody and the birds and the bees that we all talk about there's not going to be that God is the Holy Spirit is going to create in you life the same way that God took that dirt and the mud and breathed life into it back at the beginning of time beginning of mankind God is going to breathe life into Mary's womb. That's amazing. That's 
that's amazing to me. When I stop and think about the power of God to create. It must have been amazing to Mary as well to hear those words. I'm persuaded that the reason that we came to church today was because we need to be reminded of what Gabriel says here. No word from God will ever fail. Isn't that why you're here? God has told you that if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, name him as Lord, name him as the king of your life, you'll be saved from your sins. You can have salvation through my power. I can redeem you. I can save you from eternal damnation. We believe that. Because if we didn't, not a single one of us would be in this room. Not a single person would be in a church building, in, in church buildings around the world this morning if we did not believe that. That God has the power to save us. That God says it and it will happen. Mary is a human being just like us. I need to know something from God. I need to know that his word will not fail. It never has, and it never will. You know, I believe God is trying to speak to us. I know he's trying to speak to me. What I've learned over the years is that this isn't just a church service. And that's what I used to think. I used to think this was a church service, and I have a job to do. I have to lead songs. I have to preach. I have a job to do, and I'm going to do my job, and that the quality of the service is dependent on the quality of job that I do. And you don't know how many mornings, how many times I've stood up here and felt so inadequate and faked my way through it. I don't think that anymore. Oh, I still think I'm inadequate. I don't think the first part anymore. I don't think the first part that it's my responsibility, it's my job to do this. It's my opportunity to share with you the power of God in my life. You see, what we're doing here is we're trying to facilitate. We're trying to facilitate for you and you and you and you and you and, you and, you and, you and, you and everyone here. We're trying to facilitate having a moment with God. That's what our service is about. Drawing us closer to God. It's not about how well you sing, which Mark has mentioned this morning. It's not about how well we read scripture. It's not about how much you pray and how deep the words are in your prayer. It's not about how I present this message. We are here to facilitate a meeting with God. We are here to meet God and hold him to his promise that his words Never fail. So maybe today you need to be reminded of that. Incredible part is the lesson doesn't end here. The lesson that, that I think is trying to be shared through this particular message doesn't end here. Let's read verse 38. After all this wonderful news, after all this, these issues of, 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 of maybe being stoned, of being divorced, uh, of, of being rejected, of, of all these other things, the mechanical part of what's going on here, Mary says this, I am the Lord's servant. May your word to me be fulfilled. And the angel left. May it be to me as you have said. Here's the big idea for today. For anybody here who might feel like they're a little inadequate for the task, that you're a little inadequate for the places that you find yourself in life, this is what we learned from Mary. Your inadequacy is God's greatest opportunity. We are looking for a reason to believe God. Because difficulties expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. Whatever you feel like your inadequacy is, this is God's greatest opportunity to use you. You like the background there? 
everybody, anybody ever seen that on the television? Technical difficulties. The technical difficulties in your life expose the authenticity of our confidence in God. When you are troubled, when troubles come upon you, that is when you are tested to see how much you believe the promises, the words of God that never fail, how, how, how much you hold on to those, how much you cling to those, how much hope you find in that. You know, it's okay when we ask the question, well, can we do big things for God? The thing is that I want God to use my talents. I want God to use my strengths. I want him to use my opportunities. I want him to use my accomplishments. We want to be the guy in the end zone holding the football like we talked about in our class this morning. We want to be the one who scores the touchdown. We want to do it on our terms and our abilities. Why? Because we're comfortable with that, aren't we? It makes sense. God gave me a good voice, now I get to lead songs. It just, it just makes sense. God gave me a good brain, so now I can memorize scripture. It just, it just makes sense. But there are other times that God says, you know what? I'm going to leverage your weakness. I'm going to leverage your inadequacy. Your inability. Your lack of opportunity. I'm going to use your inadequate life for my glory. I'm going to accomplish my goal through your inadequacy so that everyone will know what? Him. God will use your inadequacies, your failures, your impossibilities to demonstrate to the world how powerful He is, how loving He is, how merciful He is, how in control of everything He is. And when we look at Mary, we see a couple of things. We see, that not, should not be the first one. I'm looking for a reason to believe. There it is. I got way ahead of myself. I preached half my sermon without realizing where I was. We look for a reason to believe God. Whenever there's a gap between what God calls us to do and our ability, our past, and God's vision for our future, our insecurities and walking with confidence in God's leading. The first thing to do is to look for a reason to believe. For Mary, the reason to believe this announcement from Gabriel is that there was another miraculous birth in her relative Elizabeth. Elizabeth, who is very old, and according to those days, you were not considered even old until you were about 60. I'm not calling anybody in here old. The Bible just did. Luke tells us, that she and Zechariah were old and unable to have children. Now she's pregnant with John the baptizer. Mary's looking for a reason to believe. Why should I believe you, Gabriel? Because your relative Mary, your, your relative Elizabeth, the old woman who is years beyond childbirth age, is pregnant as well. Mary is looking for a reason to believe. You know, most of us base our, base our faith on circumstances and it looks something like this. You know, life is good. And when life is good, God is near. Driving in this morning, I caught every green light. God's with me. <laughs> Went to Walmart yesterday, got the first parking spot. God was with me. Get a raise, you get a better job. God's with me. God really showed up. But when things are not so good, you catch that first red light and you know that the timing is going to be off and every other red light after that, you're going to catch it. Where are you, God? What's going on? What have I done? Thumbs, that's our attitude. Why are you punishing me? And again, I think that that difficult time exposed the authenticity of our confidence. Is our confidence in ourselves or is our confidence in God? When things are going bad, when things are the way we don't understand, when things are hurtful and stressful and debilitating, 
it, it, it tests our faith and it exposes how authentic our faith in God is. In Matthew chapter 11 and Luke chapter 9, either John or John's disciples or both start to have doubts about Jesus. John's in prison. His disciples don't know what to do. It may be a test from John. John's faith may have never wavered, but he may have some doubts as he faces death. And he sends his disciples to Jesus and he asks the question, are you the one? Are you the Messiah? Are you the one who is to come? And Jesus doesn't even answer that question. Jesus says, go back and report to John what you've seen and what you've heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, the good news is proclaimed to the poor. I'm persuaded that Jesus is saying to John, and John's disciples, look for a reason to believe. When your faith is being tested, look for a reason to believe. When your faith isn't being tested, continue to look for a reason to believe. And the second thing that I think we need to look at is we need to look for a relationship to sustain our faith in God. Mary's going to travel about 70 miles from Nazareth into Judea to spend the next few months with Elizabeth. Why? So she can have a relationship to sustain her faith in God. Every time she had, looks at Mary, every time she talks to Mary, what is she going to see? A 60 plus year old woman having a child. I'm having a relationship with somebody who has a relationship with God, somebody who's been blessed by God, somebody who knows God, somebody who's walking with God. Mary is seeking out that relationship, and so should we. You know, when we came here 10, 11, 12 years ago, I look around this room and I see great, wonderful people. In times past, I put these people on a pedestal and said to myself, you know, why can't I be perfect like them? The problem with that is twofold. You laughed at the first one. I think you know what the first one is. Number one, we're not perfect. And number two, now that I know you're not perfect, I got to knock you off that pedestal. And because I've knocked you off that pedestal in my mind, I don't want to be like you. Now, you didn't ask to be up there. You didn't ask for to be elevated to such stature. Not a single one of you looked at me and said, you know what, David, I'm perfect. So lift me high and think more highly of me than you do other people or even yourself. Not a single person projected that. But you know what they did project? You know what you still project? David, follow me as I follow Jesus. Be patient with me as God is patient with you. And tell me, David, we're going to love you. We're going to love your wife. We're going to love your sons in the same way that Jesus, that God, that the Holy Spirit loves me. We are a flawed people. We are a sinful people. But thank God we are a forgiven people. In the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And if I've learned nothing else from this congregation, I've learned that. Those are the kind of people that you want to have a relationship with. It is those relationships that have sustained me through some of my worst days. Mary and Elizabeth. I've had several people, too many to mention, say, who do you have a relationship with that has helped you sustain your faith? I look out in the room and I can name you one by one. Two people come to mind, three people come to mind. Charles Wyatt gave me a purpose in this congregation. He took me under his wing and said, Hang out with me for a little while. I'll teach you a few things. Andy Bradley 
You helped rescue me from so many things through our time in prayer. And she doesn't like me to mention this, but my wife. Because when I look at her, I see God. I see what God has blessed me with. And I want to fight to hold on to those things. I want to fight to hold on to those people. I want to fight to hold on to those relationships. Look for a reason to believe in God. Look for a relationship that helps you sustain your faith in God. So, in our quest to find Jesus, where is he in this story? I know we're, he's enunciated, but where is Jesus? I'm going to tell you where Jesus is. For a 15 year old girl from the middle of nowhere with very few big opportunities in her life came the greatest man of all time. Mary says to the Lord's servant, Gabriel, and she is saying directly to God, may it be to me as you have said. She is saying... My will be done. She raises Jesus, and time and time again in her life, she comes back to this May it be to me as you have said. May your word be fulfilled in me. Not my will, but thine. You think that perhaps God chose correctly when he chose Mary? I'm persuaded that this is a lesson that she would teach her son over and over and over again. It's a lesson that Jesus, our Messiah, would relive in the garden. That Jesus would look to his mother and the things that God had done in her life and see reasons to believe that Jesus would recall her faith. He would recall his relationship with his mother. He would recall his relationship with Joseph, a godly man. He would recall his relationship with his heavenly father to help sustain him through the garden and beyond. I'm not deifying Mary. I'm simply acknowledging how she allowed Jesus to use her for big things. And so we're left with that question again. Do you ever feel inadequate? Can God use me for big things? If we answer like Mary, if we answer like Jesus, indeed. Indeed he can, and indeed he will. May it be to me as you have said. It's an open door for God to use you for his purposes when we surrender our will to God. Not my will, but thine be done. And when we say that, we become candidates for God to use us for big things. I'm way over time, I appreciate your patience with me this morning. I believe Mike has a song prepared for us. If you, in your life, looking for a reason to believe in God. It's found in here. If you in your life are looking for a relationship to deepen your faith in God, it's all around you. We invite you to respond as we stand and as we sing.